Hello, this is Mr. Hampshire here. Today we're going to have a short introduction to Chapter 15, Genetic Engineering, where we will be building on what we learned in Chapter 11, Mendel's work on genetics and principles of how things are passed on, and also uh, Chapter 12, where we talked about DNA and the structure of DNA. Chapter 15 really begins to apply that. So in the first section, Chapter 15-1, we're looking at what is selective breeding used for, and how do people increase genetic variation? How do we end up, like the, the picture of the dogs up here, how do we end up with all these different kinds, sizes, types of dogs? And looking at them, you might think they might be different species, when in actuality, they're all the same species. Selective breeding, humans have used for ages, so your key term there is that this is done by humans. We're using natural variation, so differences we see between you and I. We're both humans. We have differences, and when you breed your animals or plants, you're going to try to breed traits that you want to keep. For example, if you look at the animals, you've got really big dogs like the Great Dane that were selected large traits for hunting, herding sheep, uh, guarding properties and pulling carts where you have small dogs like the terriers that were either bred for hunting in small rodent holes or for lap dogs for royalty. Now, obviously you, don't, you can't have a Great Dane sitting on the uh, sitting on the Queen's lap that would be a little awkward. Uh, plants is another example 6,000 years ago in Central America there was Teosinte, this grass-like plant and it was bred by the Native Americans, so you see that across the top here, that's the male part of the plant that's producing pollen. So in our current corn plant, that would be the tassel. And down here, you can see where it had these small, really hard seeds. And after thousands of years of, of crossbreeding and breeding, certain, trying to get certain traits, we have our modern female part of the plant, the corn ear down here, which is one of our biggest grain crops, at least here in the U.S., besides soybeans. Um, one of the ways that we do this is called hybridization. Uh, hybridization is crossing dissimilar individuals to bring together the best of both organisms. The result of a hybridization cross we call a hybrid. One of the, uh, we would call maybe the father of modern hybridization or one of the best selective breeders of all time was Luther Burbank. Uh, lived late 1800s, early 1900s. This is a picture of him here. Developed over 800 new varieties of plants. And his goal was to, you know, with the uh, potato example down here, which we call the Burbank russet potato, named after him, was to get disease resistance, so they're easier for the farmers to grow, plus food producing capacity, so something that is we as humans would like to eat. Uh, in the background of this picture here, you see a spineless cactus that he had developed to use for cattle food, because obviously cattle would not like to eat cacti with, with spines on them. Uh, Shasta daisy is another example, and the list, like I say, the list goes on and on and on. Part of the, the problem with hybridization is that once you get an individual or an organism with des the desired characteristics, is that to maintain those characteristics, you, it often leads to inbreeding. You have to breed like individuals to keep those same traits. This ensures desired characteristics are maintained within a breed. Uh, if you register your puppies with the AKC Kennel Club, they have guidelines on who they should be bred to and where the baby puppies, you know, who the mom and dads can be. There is also a risk. Uh, those of you that are into breeding purebred cattle or dogs and so forth know that a lot of recessive genes, like at the pedigree of the horse down here, you see right here is a recessive gene. Let's say that's uh, some kind of uh, disease or, or defect that we don't want to show up. Okay? If you're a heterozygote, it doesn't show up, so you don't see it in this horse. When you look at the offspring, and here you have a brother-sister cross, you increase the chance of 
getting that recessive gene to show up. Uh, we see that nowadays with dogs. For example, some purebred lines of dogs uh, can deal with issues like hip dysplasia, uh, cancer, and you know, look at the the wiener dogs that have bred to have really long backs can have spinal problems, uh, cataracts, and the list kind of goes on. So you want to make sure when you're buying a purebred dog, a lot of times they will have them genetically tested to make sure they don't have those genes or those traits. What about if we want to find, have something new, something novel, something not found in nature? Scientists also use the, uh, the principles of genetics to breed new types of food, organisms. Uh, they use the natural variation found in nature. This is one of my favorite examples, especially uh, this being the fall, October, my favorite time of the year, where they take natural occurring apples, all these varieties that you can go to the store and find, and the University of Minnesota, they won't give out which ones they crossed, obviously, for, for money reasons, but they cross all these different kinds of apples and they did some special crosses to get the Honeycrisp apple. Okay, one of my favorite apples. The cells, the cells in the Honeycrisp are larger, and when you bite into them, you know, the juice comes running down your chin. Okay, that was bred to be tart but sweet and full of juice. Okay, that's done by taking variation we find in nature and getting it into one type of apple. Or if the variation is not found in nature, they can actually induce mutations. Okay, now when we look at the term mutations, where we learned about that in the previous chapter, you're taking the structure of DNA, the A's, T's, G's, and C's, and we're going to try to mess those up. Okay, so this is the application of this is called biotechnology, where we're going to sort of work with the genetics of our organisms and try to change them or manipulate them. Um, some examples, uh, one would be bacterial. We'll also talk about plants. Bacterial mutations are done by using chemicals or use of radiation. And it takes some luck and perseverance because remember mutations are random changes in the DNA. Some of the changes you might not notice some of the changes might be bad but hopefully with a little bit of luck you can get changes that will create a a good phenotype that you can use somehow uh, bacteria are easy to work with because on a petri plate you can zap with radiation or treat with chemicals and you're treating millions of little tiny critters at one time so your chance of getting a positive mutation is a lot higher uh, for example this is these are some pictures from the deep well horizon oil spill that happened in the Gulf of Mexico back in 2010. You know, the old way of cleaning up oil spills, you know, you're sucking it up, you're putting up barriers, you're trying to actually light it on fire and burn it off. Scientists are working with some bacteria that can digest oil. And so here's a picture of these little bacteria working on some little globules of, of oil here. And they're trying to radiate them, treat them so they can actually become more efficient at doing it. So here you have a glass of water and you see little clumps of oil, little black blobs down here. And after several weeks of after adding the bacteria, you see the water still cloudy but much clearer. And some of the oil residue that's left in the water will slowly break down over time by other organisms as well. So we're, we're going to try to change these bacteria to do something helpful for us. The other the, in the other area that we have used, induced a lot of mutations, is using drugs that prevent, okay, in meiosis, when you have your homologous chromosomes lined up in the center of the cell, there's drugs that keep these from being pulled apart. So it'll keep, both of them will pull to one side, okay? And what this does is it increases the chromosome number. So what that does to the plant is it makes the plant bigger, stronger, um, sometimes juicier, sweeter, more cold hardy, frost resistant, or just better to eat. For example, uh, watermelons and bananas are both what we call triploid organisms. In other words, they have three sets of DNA. 
Now in animals this doesn't work so well and we've talked about that in previous chapters where if animals have extra or missing chromosomes usually it's not a good thing and it leads to some side effects that are not good. Here's a kiwi fruit. Kiwi are 6N and again one of my other favorite fruits here are strawberries which are actually 8N and if you remember back to our DNA chapter we actually extracted DNA out of a strawberry and could because there was so much of it packed into each of these cells. Okay, So this is just sort of a brief, inter a brief overview of how scientists use selective breeding, some of the natural variation we find in nature, along with kind of creating our own with chemicals or radiation to affect the genetics of organisms.